Well, the sermon uh, for today is entitled The Great uh, Commission. It's not a new uh, topic to many of us. In fact, I would imagine all of us would have heard this uh, phrase uh, before. But I, I guess it is important for us to not just listen to this message as in I've heard this before or I've understood this before, but to ask the question as you hear the message, uh, Lord, what are you saying to me in my life in this season with this message? All right. So that's what uh, you can do. And that will help you to really receive what the Lord is speaking to you right now, even through the message. But for this uh, sermon, it is taken out of a sermon series that is based on the book Multiply. And let me, so far, we have covered five parts. The first part is that of living as a disciple maker. The second part is living as a church. Third part is how to study the Bible. And then we went on to the fourth part, which is understanding the Old Testament. And now we are in the fifth part, which is understanding the New Testament. And that's where we are taking the message from. Part five, understanding the New Testament, the Great Commission. So for those of us who are new to this sermon series, although we are coming almost to the end, uh, fear not, you can download a free copy of the book uh, from the following link. And there is also... Uh, there are also videos in which you can watch and follow along if you want to catch up on some of the teachings that are found within this book. Apart from the materials that are found in the book, we also include additional materials which we think would help us better understand the topic. So like today, I will be including the passage from Acts chapter 8, verse 26 to 40 to illustrate the topic, which is the Great Commission. Jesus' mission on earth was to see God's power, love, and healing permeate every aspect of this broken world and our broken lives. He came to see God's will done on earth as it is in heaven. Now, one day, Jesus will return to finish this task, to take all things and make them new. We find this in Revelation 21 verse 5. But in the meantime... He has given us, you and me, a mission to accomplish. So today we want to explore two areas to understand this mission that God has given to us. Now, first is the mission of the church. That's the first area we want to look at. The second area we want to look at is to understand the great commission. And of course, under this second area, there are five uh, sub points that will help us fully understand what the Great Commission is all about. So it covers the authority of Jesus, a worldwide mission, the call to make disciples, my presence will be with you, and the power of the Holy Spirit. So let's take a look at the first area, which is the mission of the church. Now, in every way, Jesus was what the world had been waiting for. He was the answer for all of Israel's hopes and the embodiment of God's plan of redemption. Nothing could be more important for this world than Jesus' mission on earth. As the disciples began to recognize that Jesus was truly the Christ, uh, seeing the importance of what Jesus was doing. Imagine how surprised and disappointed they must have been when Jesus died. And imagine how the excitement must have hit all-time high when he rose uh, from the grave. The mission to restore the world was, in a sense, back in motion. Jesus could now assume Israel's throne and rule the world in righteousness and peace. But that's not how the story goes, isn't it? At least not immediately. Instead of wrapping up human history then and then, Jesus gave his disciples an all-important task. And we find this task spelled out in Matthew chapter 28, verse 18 
to 20. Let's take a look again, at it again. Jesus gave his charge. God authorized and commanded me to commission you. Go out and train everyone you meet far and near in this way of life, marking them by baptism in a threefold name, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Then instruct them in the practice of all I have commanded you. I will be with you as you do this, day after day after day, right up to the end of the age. Well, just in case you're wondering which version this is, uh, this is the message version that I'm reading. Uh, Matthew 28, verse 18 to 20. Now, we are called to spread God's rule or Christ's rule on earth through making disciples, and this is called the Great Commission. We share the good news of a king who conquered death and who caused every part of his creation to submit to his benevolent reign. Okay, so next we want to look at the second area, which is understanding the Great Commission. So in order to fully understand what we are called to do, we will analyze the Great Commission. Firstly, we look at the authority of Jesus. So again, in Matthew 28, verse 18, it says, Jesus gave his charge. God authorized and commanded me to commission you. As Jesus delivered this command to his followers, he began with a very important statement. God authorized and commanded me to commission you. Now, here we have the foundation of the Great Commission. We serve a king who over every square inch of creation. This authority extends not only to animals and plants and weather patterns, but also to every human being on the planet. Understanding this truth should give us confidence as we move out into the world that is opposed to God's reign. Since all authority belongs to Jesus Christ, we are obligated to obey the Great Commission. The command is clear. But this is more than co-obedience. The king who commands us to make disciples is the same king who sacrificed himself to give us life. All right? Now, so it is our pleasure to serve this king. And we should find joy in submitting to his will. And even as we enjoy a healed relationship with our king, we also want every person on earth to experience this great salvation. Now, next, Jesus said that this is going to be a worldwide mission. Again, let's look at Matthew 28, verse 18 uh, to 20. It says, Jesus gave his charge. Go out and train everyone you meet far and near. Go out and train everyone you meet far and near. Though Jesus entered a specific culture in a specific part of the world, he is more than a local religious figure. Jesus is the savior given by God for all people, regardless of race, nationality, and other distinction. And because every person on planet Earth has rebelled against God, everyone needs the salvation that Jesus offers. So because of this, Jesus calls his church to move out into every corner of the world with this one and only hope of healing and of salvation. We find in Acts chapter 4, verse 12, which tells us very clearly, salvation comes no other way. No other name has been or will be given to us by which we can be safe. Only this one. Now, this is a very important sentence and statement and, and verse for us. Let me read that again. Salvation comes no other way. No matter how people think, there are many other ways to God. But the word of God tells us salvation comes no other way. No other name has been 
or will be given to us by which we can be saved. This one, the name of Jesus. This worldwide mission belongs to the church and it ought to characterize our efforts every day, yours and mine. There is no denying that the task of taking the gospel to the nations is massive and not forgetting also our family members and friends and co-workers who need to uh, know Jesus as well. Now, thankfully, we aren't alone in this supernatural task. Making disciples is ultimately God's work, and he will accomplish it in his power. All right? But God's commitment to his plan of redemption does not absolve us from our responsibility to obey his commands. God will reach every corner of this earth, uh, and he has chosen to accomplish this task by working through his church, referring to you and to me, okay? So at this point in time, it is good for me to talk about the mission work of the Diocese of Singapore. The Diocese of Singapore covers six other countries beside the island of Singapore. Uh, namely, the Diocese of Singapore look after uh, Cambodia, Indonesia, Laos, Nepal, Thailand, and then Vietnam, six other countries. So the Diocese of Singapore proclaims the gospel we have received with the aim of establishing indigenous dioceses, meaning local worshipping communities in those countries, among the nations under our care, and to support the missions of other uh, beyond our own diocese. Now, once uh, travel is allowed, we want to explore overseas mission uh, in these six countries that belongs to the mission work of the Diocese of Singapore. Well, you can visit the Anglican Mission website to find out more. There are lots of information, including videos of the mission work in these six countries. And I, I encourage you to quickly take a snapshot of this, uh, uh, this slide. It has got the website address to the Anglican Mission work. And I'm sure you'll find many things inside there that will stir your spirit and you can pray along for all those who are involved in this ministry. Next, Jesus gave us the call to make disciples. So again in Matthew 28, Jesus gave his charge, go out and train, instruct them in the practice of all I have commanded you. Disciple making is rooted in God's plan of redemption central to God's heart for his people. And as we have said, a disciple is simply a follower of Jesus. If we believe that Jesus is who he says he is, and we do what he tells us to do, then we are his disciples, as simple as that. So the process of disciple making amounts to telling other people about Jesus and calling them to follow him as well. So telling people about Jesus and calling them to follow him. Jesus said that in making disciples of all nations, we are to baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and to teach them to obey all that he commanded. So the first step for those who choose to follow Jesus Christ and have been transformed by his Spirit then is to identify with Christ through being baptized. Just as Jesus was buried in the earth and then raised up into new life, so the new Christian is buried under uh, the water in baptism and brought up again as a symbol of the new life he or she has received. Baptism also initiates a new believer into Christ's church, where he or she becomes a member of a local body of believers, just like us in St. Andrew City Church. This initial step is non-negotiable. It is a command of Jesus Christ, and we should consider it a privilege to identify with Christ and his people through baptism. 
salvation is not like receiving a train ticket to heaven where the ticket gets us on board. But after that, we put it in our pocket and we forget about it. Rather, salvation is like a marriage where we can enter into a relationship with Jesus Christ and become a part of his family, the church, right? So the Christian life is a process of better understanding what Jesus taught, learning to apply that teaching in our everyday lives, and then teaching others around us and people on the other side of the globe to do the same. Next, Jesus said, my presence will be with you, even as you embark on this great mission. In Matthew 28, the highlighted version, portion rather, it says, I will you do this day after day after day, right up to the end of the age. If the Great Commission sounds impossible to you, that is because it is true, it is. As daunting as a task to make disciples of all nations on the face of the earth would be by itself, we also face serious opposition, isn't it? We have got Satan, the world, and our sinful desires fighting against our growth in the Christian life and in, against us in the advancement of the gospel. And Paul warns us, that if we are going to live out this mission, we will experience persecution. You heard it right. Paul warns us that if we are going to live out this mission, we will experience persecution. So we find this in 2 Timothy 3.12. It tells us very simply and plainly, anyone who wants to live out, uh, live all out for Christ, is in for a lot of trouble. There is no getting around it. It can't get clearer than that. Let me read that again. Anyone who wants to live all out for Christ is in for a lot of trouble. There is no getting around it. This very day, Christians around the world are being persecuted, beaten, and even put to death for identifying with Jesus Christ. We are mistaken if we think our message will always be received warmly. But while opposition is real and intimidating, Jesus' final words in the Great Commission should give us great courage. Let me read that to you again. I will be with you as you do this. I will be with you as you do this day after day after day, right up to the end of the age. Isn't it wonderful? The promise of Jesus that he will be with us day after day after day, right up to the end of the age. Jesus' very presence is promised to you and to me so that we do not need to be afraid. And finally, I want to close off with this final point which is the power of the Holy Spirit. I would like to share the story of Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch from the book of Acts to encourage us to go in the power of the Holy Spirit. But interestingly, this story also illustrates for us before other points before, which is a worldwide mission the call to make disciples, and my presence will be with you. Let's take a look. So let us recount uh, the story in Acts chapter 8, 26 to 40. So an angel of the Lord said to Philip, go south down the desert road that runs from Jerusalem to Gaza. So Philip started out, and he met the treasurer of Ethiopia and Yunnan of great authority under the Kendik, the queen of Ethiopia. Although this eunuch has great authority, Jesus said, or rather Jesus is saying to you and to me that all authority, which is the greatest, has been given to him. And he has commissioned us to go 
and so that we do not have to be afraid, even if we have to speak to someone with authority. Isn't it interesting? The eunuch had gone to Jerusalem to worship, and he was now returning, seated in his carriage. He was reading aloud from the book of the prophet Isaiah. And the Holy Spirit said to Philip, go over and walk along beside the carriage. So here we see the Holy Spirit at work prompting Philip to go near and later guiding him in his sharing with the unit. And we also see the call to a worldwide mission, isn't it? The good news is not just restricted to the Jews, but even to this eunuch from Ethiopia. So Philip ran over and heard the man reading from the prophet Isaiah. And Philip asked this eunuch, do you understand what you are reading? And the eunuch replied, how can I, unless someone instructs me? And he urged Philip to come up into the carriage and sit with him. So here we see the making of a disciple, which eventually, at the end of the sharing, the eunuch requested to be baptized, which is the initial step after one believes in Jesus. Can you see the picture? Can you see how it flows? Now, you may ask me, where do I see in this passage the presence of Jesus, right? Because Jesus said early on in Matthew 28 that, I will be with you as you do this day after day after day until the end of the age. So where do I see this in the passage, the presence of Jesus? That's a good question. You're right, I cannot find it stated anywhere explicitly in this verses 26 to 40. But I know that Jesus was right there with Philip. Because Jesus promised to be there, Jesus was right there with Philip. Besides that, what I see is also the presence of Jesus being seen in the life of Philip. Now, let me repeat that again. What I see is also the presence of Jesus being seen in the life of Philip. What do I mean? One of the doctrines is called incarnation. God becoming man so that he can identify with us and we relate to him. Now, in some ways, Philippians 2 describes this for us. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was, and was born as a human being, right? So God becoming man. Jesus spends time with people so that he can relate to them and they relate to him. When you look at the passage, we find Philip doing just that. Philip go to the desert to spend time with, he don't know who yet, he just went because the angel told him to. And Philip go over and walk along beside the carriage. Philip heard what the eunuch was reading. And Philip asked, do you understand what you are reading? And Philip went up to the carriage to sit with the eunuch and they journeyed together. Philip had a conversation with the eunuch on things that bothered him. And eventually, Philip shared the good news. And this is what we are to do as well, you and me. Go as the Holy Spirit leads you to. It may be an uncomfortable place, like for Philip, it was the desert road. Go over and walk along with the person. It could be a colleague, it could be a friend, a family member, or maybe even someone whom you hardly know. Go journey with the person. Listen to what is on the person's mind. The person may not disclose all at once, but as you show interest and concern, there's a high chance that the person will open up. Take your mind off this, uh, this thought, I need to convert this person, I need to convert this person. Uh, take your mind off that. Rather, focus on journeying with the person who has a need that Jesus can meet. 
Let me repeat that again. Take your mind off this statement. Rather, focus on journeying with the person who has a need that Jesus can meet. Ask the Holy Spirit to guide you in your conversation. The Holy Spirit can prompt you with uh, a timely statement or a word that matters to the person. Now, this is what I experienced recently. I was given a statement by the Holy Spirit that does not matter to me, but it mattered a lot to the person whom I'm speaking to. And when I release it in obedience and in a loving and concerned uh, manner, the word just landed on the person's heart like a ton of brick. I was amazed. But the Holy Spirit has got a timely word that you can hear and release and give it to the person. Now, share, then share what you know and have experience about God, his love, his protection, his providence for you and your family. And then when the opportunity arises, uh, share the good news, share the gospel. This pandemic has somewhat dampened our momentum for sharing the good news through big events. And in turn, it has dampened our own momentum to share the good news with others as well. We want to recognize it, we want to admit it, and we want to ask God to help us pick up the momentum, right? Even for me. Way before this pandemic, Jesus promised that the church will fulfill its mission. In Matthew 16, 18, Jesus said this, this is the rock on which I will put together my church, a church so expensive with energy that not even the gates of hell will be able to keep it out. I really like this four words, so expensive with energy. And my prayer is this, Lord, I pray that you revise, revive us and grants us this expensive energy. God chose to fulfill his promises on earth through his church, and he does not have a backup plan. God will use us, you and me, as a church to reach the world with the hope and healing that is found in Jesus Christ. Oh, as I end the message today, I think it is good for us to respond to what the Lord is saying to us. Like I mentioned, as I begin in this message, uh, this is not a new message, the Great Commission. We have heard it before in various ways. But we want to ask, Lord, what are you saying to me in my life, in this season, with this word? So as I end, I want to guide us in responding to the Lord with a few things that I've spelled out. I think it is good for us to ask the Lord to show us three people whom he's asking us to journey with, to understand what are their needs in their lives from now on until the end of the year. Okay? So we ask the Lord, Lord, whom are you showing me that you want me to reach out to and I can journey with from now on until the end of the year? And as the Lord plays in you the three people and asking you to journey with them, right? I mean, take your mind off, I need to convert this person, I need to convert this person. Focus on what are their needs, find out their needs and journey with them, sit with them, Okay. And then intentionally plan uh, to invite them for coffee or for a meal, lunch or dinner, or even pay them a visit. Okay? All right? And then pray for them on your own. And when the opportunity arises, pray with them. Right? Ask them, can I pray together with you? Or when it opens further the door. Ask them that question. Can I share the gospel with you? Do you want to believe in Jesus? Okay. So these are the ways in which we can respond to what we are hearing today from this uh, passage. As I close, I just want us to uh, close our eyes. I'm going to lead us into 
a few moments of uh, just silence and then allow the Lord to bring to mind uh, the three person whom he's asking us to uh, journey with from now to the end of the year. So let us bow our heads and close our eyes and allow the Lord to speak. Lord, I thank you for the reminder from your word in Matthew 28, verse 18 to 20 this afternoon. Lord, as we hear your word, not a new word, we've heard this before, but we ask that you would speak to us uh, whom you are asking us to journey with, the tree person, from now to the end of the year. Let's spend a few moments just allowing the Lord to speak to us. Lord, we thank you for your promise to us that you, uh, <clears throat> you are with us day after day after day until the end of the age, even as we embark on this mission that you have entrusted to us. Lord, I thank you for giving us the, a picture of the tree person, the names of this tree person. We pray, Lord, that you grant us the grace to journey with these three people from now to the end of the year. Uh, grant us the grace to uh, converse with them, to spend time with them, and to know how we can help them, Lord, in this season of their lives. Uh, there are things that we do not know and understand, so we ask for wisdom, we ask for discernment, and we ask that you provide us with the right resources uh, that would be of help to these three people. So we thank you once again for hearing our prayers. We, we ask, Lord, as we journey on from now to the end of the year, uh, help us to pick up the momentum to uh, lift up your name and to move forward to share with others your love, your grace, and your mercy. So, Lord, we thank you. We pray this and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.